Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, hello, and thank you all for joining us tonight for this presentation. Right. Here at the James Castle House, um, we're going to be introducing resident Ellen Mansfield. My name is Monica Galvan, and I am the Cultural Sites Program Coordinator for the James Castle House. I am here tonight with Stephen, and he will be providing CBI interpretation. And we are also joined by um, Sierra and Deb. Thank you for being here. Debbie, thank you for being here. I like to give a little introduction to the James Castle House for anyone unfamiliar with us. The James Castle House celebrates the life and work of American artist James Castle through exhibitions, community programs, research, residency programs, and conversations of the historic spaces where Castle lived and worked for over four decades. The James Castle House is a program of the Boise City Department of Arts and History, which offers many other services, including public art, history programs, archives, cultural grants, and care and conservation. I want to thank the City of Boise for its ongoing support and for remaining committed to our work at the Art and History Department. Before I move on to, with this event, I like to acknowledge the broader history of the land that the James Castle House is on. We recognize the ancestral, cultural, and traditional and unceded territory of the Shoshone Bannock and Northern Paiute people whose land the site is on today. The room where we sit in today displays our current exhibition. It's interlude, a five-year residency retrospective it pairs contemporary artwork by James Castle House residents with original works by James Castle. For those of you who are here in the room, I would invite you to take a look once we're done with the presentation. <laughs> Through poetry, printmaking, painting, and a variety of other artistic mediums, each resident translated their time in residency into a new body of work. Please plan a visit if you are joining us on Zoom before it comes down April 27th. We are excited for Elle and Mansfield to share with us tonight. After the presentation, we will have a question and answer period. So please feel free to write in your thoughts in the Q&A throughout, and then we'll address them at the end. And for those of you here, we'll take your questions after she's done as well. Now on to the main event. Ellen Manfield is a multidisciplinary artist currently residing in Fredericks, Maryland. Through drawing, painting, ceramics, and other media, she channels her experience as a deaf individual to explore terms of death history and life influence. This includes creating in the style of Dibia. She celebrates and promotes American Sign Language and deaf culture. Ellen has been so gracious with her time and is here inviting the community members to join her in her studio outside of her commitment to the residency. She engaged in conversation with students from the Boise School District who are also part of hearing, and she will be engaging in conversation with the Boise, Boise, Boise State University ASL students who are eager to learn about her practice. We thank you for the time that you have given us. Welcome, Ellen Matthews. Hello, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be here. I want to first thank you all and thank the James Castle House Committee for choosing me to go on this long journey that I've taken to arrive to where I'm at today. It's been nine weeks so far, and I get to show you part of that journey that I've been on creating art while being here in the James Castle House. Next slide, please. The prior picture, that was James Castle. 
um, within his overalls. And you'll see that, you'll get to see that pretty quickly. Pretty common sense that that's James Castle. So my responsibility was to bring the different materials to the James Castle house. I've got, you know, 30, 40 years worth of materials. I've got ceramic tools, three different files or tiles, 12 by 12 tiles that I brought. I've got four color glazes, lots of different colors, black, white, red, and a gloss. I've got 28 small color glazes and two ounce jars in, a, in tin boxes. I've got brush paints, small acrylic bottles, different markers, oil pastels, print materials, and painting materials as well. Um, there are different other materials like flowery dress from the mid eighties. Um, I thought I could make something out of that. I even brought some of my parents' old bed sheets from the 1970s as a potential medium. I brought an old New York City map book. I thought that was interesting to, you know, see the overlay of back in the day. So I brought that. Wasn't sure if that was something I was going to use. Some lace papers. Back when I was an art student and when I graduated, I'd moved to Maryland shortly after. I decided to go to New York City to go to this really prestigious art store. It's similar to an art store here called Quality Art for some pearl paint. But in New York City, there's four or five uh, stories. So I had brought some things from Maryland. Um, I had bought some things to bring to Maryland. Um, and there were some other nice printer paper and other things that I'd mailed here. Um, I wasn't sure. And so different wallpaper that I had brought in from back when I had gotten married as well. A uh, bisque vase bowl and then embossed roller from Poland. So the bisque vase bowl, that was already made and I thought that I would go ahead and bring it here. to see if that was gonna be something to have some in inspiration as well. And then an embossed roller that was actually from Poland. So I was, and also with, in addition to that, some clay. Go ahead, next slide. <clears throat> I did purchase a few materials while here. I had gone to the Potter Center um, and gone to a ceramics class there. So there were a few materials in addition to what I brought a clay bag. I didn't bring mine, so I had purchased one from the Potter Center. Art tape, lino cuts and foam, lino cut foam blocks. And then I ordered um, alphabet decals. And those were the only new things that I had purchased while in town. So that's the beginning of my journey. So the first or second week I was here, this is some art I was thinking about. So this is a, a drawing I had made of James Castle. This was me jumping into his space and his room in the shed. And I wanted to see what the world looked like from his eyes, you know, the art that he made every day, who he was. So this was a peek into his life and his journey. It was sort of a deep dive. I really wanted to see the space that he was in um, and how he practiced his art. So that wallpaper, that is both studio and wall or studio and home wallpaper of his. And that's the sailboats that you see in the background. <laughs> I felt so connected to James Castle. Mm -hmm. I felt that his artwork really connected to my life, that there was a sense of similarity and understanding 
not found elsewhere. To see the world through our eyes, that's where I felt this deep shared connection and the existence that we share in this world. So these are some photos that I'd taken from walking around town. A new environment for me, even you know, new street signs and funny signs that I'd seen, things that were odd to me. There were, I wondered if they were things that James Castle had seen back in his time, or if these were just things that I was stumbling upon that were new to me. There were plays on lights and shadows, numbers, um, like the number 15 and 1960. Those are numbers that connect to me, you know, birth year and date. Um, and same with addresses like the number 15. There were several similarities and connections in that sense. After a few days, I had done a self-portrait uh, of a collage of different paper and some bed sheets. And then you see the senelier, senelier word, senelier. Um, that wasn't something that, I, those were art materials that I hadn't used for a year. So I encouraged my time, or I encouraged myself during my time to explore that more. So with pastels um, and writing more, I really played with and experimented that with that. So there's a house, um, James and the head. And so you see James Castle loved to draw heads and in a square shape. And so I felt that because I was spending my time here, I would create it as a square shape in a house. And then you see Ellen, those letters in there, imposed in there. And then there's a map, the yellow bed sheet as well, creates a map of Idaho. And then at the bottom is New York and Maryland maps. And then there's that striped background. Uh, my full name is not printed in there because I'd gone online and looked at how you pronounced my name. Um, and it seemed to be that it was ELN or ELN or LN. And so that's how I decided to represent my name through phonetically. So there's the New York map of Queens. It shows where uh, the deaf school is. And they take... Uh, students from two to 12. So I had drawn a, sh a little dot, it's pretty small. The map is small itself. And then my apartment in, is in red. So here, all the way up to there. And I'd gone to school there. So I told you that I had um, seen some signs I thought were odd. And so I thought I would play with that. Um, so I thought, okay, as one thing. And then I decided to add look. And so to look and through this journey is something that I added. I had used the lit the lace mat paper. Oh, and then this was a time I had went to the collection and archives and that happened to be on Valentine's day. So I thought, I thought I, that was fitting to use that lace paper um, and do that collage on February 14th. So the Sennelier, Sennelier, Art, that was something that I had done last year in Paris. I taught a workshop in Paris. And then that there was a Picasso painting that I'd gone in the store. Thank you. 
So Picasso himself had actually gone into the store and asked to, for the store maker to create a new medium. He didn't want oil painting. He wanted oil in something like a uh, marker. So that is where pastels came from. And so I had actually visited that store and I love Picasso. So I got to see the same areas that he had gone. And so I bought those pastels from that store. And then I actually brought that here to use during my residency. Um, it's kind of sticky. It's hard to work with sometimes. I didn't use it much. I experimented with it, um, but I loved it to use that with granite. So 12 years later, uh, James Castle was actually born. I thought that was kind of interesting. So it was a, it's a very old store as well. So I went to the collection and archives of James Castle House. So there was Kate, Andrea, and another individual who'd helped me. They laid out so many um, pieces of James Castle's art that I was able to touch and get to feel with. And I really, I fell in love with his work there at the collection and archives. I didn't see as, I had never seen as much of James Castle work as I did there. And a lot of his sketches, um, I can see a lot of his life experiences through those sketches as well. And that through those sketches, he really shows what it means to have that deaf experience that he would have had. So when James Castle went to the school for the deaf, he came back home and drew things based off memory. So I decided to draw my own memories from my upbringing going to a deaf school to draw parallels to James Castle's art. So as you'll see there, that's my classroom purely off memory. There's a painting of me um, leaning into the water, almost like drowning, just because I didn't have interpreters. Um, I didn't have language. I really didn't understand what was going on in school. I didn't really truly have a, a good foundational education for about seven years. And so I feel a strong connection to James Castle in that regard because he also didn't have that language or connection to the outside world. So I see folks write, you know, different postcards and letters, like for holidays, Merry Christmas. And so I had old letters from folks who'd kept in touch from high school that I felt that was really similar to some of the letters that James Castle had received, like this Merry Christmas card. Um, and on here, you can see a self-portrait is drawn. Next slide. So that's about the second week I was here, getting to know the area, getting to know the park down here. What is the name of that park over here? Uh, Castle Hill Park. Mm -hmm. It was honored after him. It's just down the block. Uh -huh. So I found this, these pieces of bark this art um, that really I felt like represented squares and those square figures really well. So I kind of picked them up and I had drawn some art over them and eyes. I love knots of the bark on trees. And so I felt like they're eyes. And so I played with those. It's one of my favorites because it's, na it's natural. They're things that, you know, are all around us like trees and the bark off of trees. So this felt a lot like playing with dolls, but there are things found in nature. So I had re requested some custom material um, that represented, you know, grass and sky to use as a mat um, matting. Um, and so I had sewn some of the stuff on here. Go ahead, next slide. So you see the numbers on the corner three. So that process is, or the numbers in the corner represent 
the weeks that I was here. So at week three. So this is at Potter Center. I was excited that they had an Ellen Street. <laughs> I felt like I had my own mailbox, my, <laughs> my own establishment here in Boise. And it was really beautiful. I really got to explore outdoors Idaho, the mountain landscape. I love, love mountains. So that was amazing to be able to experience. And this was a rare, beautiful day. Believe me here. I've been here every day for nine weeks. That day I felt was, was rare and, and gorgeous. So remember I told you I mailed this clay pot. Well, in the mail, I didn't pack it well enough. And it seemed like it was such a rough journey from Maryland that it broke. So I was very upset. Um, I took it really personal. And so once I came to acceptance, I realized the reason why I brought it here was really to represent the dinner table syndrome. Um, that's terminology from the deaf community that represents hearing folks gathered around a dinner table and hearing folks all having a conversation while a single deaf person sits at the dinner table, unable to participate in any of the conversation. Um, so it very much represents the feeling of an outsider. And it can happen in the living room. It can happen anywhere, but it's considered the dinner table syndrome because um, those types of gatherings and conversations often happen around the dinner table. So I felt this very personal experience with this pottery that's now been broken. So I'd been practicing with oil paints, just creating circles. And I felt that really represented into a dinner dinner plate at the dinner table. And I hadn't really developed that idea much. So I thought it was interesting. I saw I had that cracked clay pot and it kind of developed the idea of the oral speaking only hearing perspective of that dinner table syndrome. So. So when I got here, I received a really nice welcome card and flowers. And um, I noticed that on the on that card had the word please on it. And so I'm I'm looking at this card and I'm seeing please to be pleased, or you can take it negatively, please. And so I sat with that. And I remember feeling, going back to my speech therapy days with please, how to pronounce please, um, and how it felt with that plate really shattered. And my speech upbringing really shattered with my deaf identity. And so please, you know. And so when I saw that word, please, and how it was separated, I put it on this plate and it felt like that was that separation of anxiety or of identities. So then the word on the bottom is kickball. And then there's signers, and that's, you can see that it turns, that, that perspective turns with those signers on the bottom. So it really represents, it comes together and represents that it's not really broken after all. So, I became really obsessed with the idea on how to pronounce the word please. So I Googled it, I YouTubed it, um, I tried to pronounce it, I looked up the pronunciation, I looked at the captions. And so how to pronounce it showed up to, that it was P-L-E-Z was how you would pronounce please. And this is one of the videos that I had looked up. So then I, created art that represented me and the dinner table syndrome. So I played around with the idea of a fishbowl 
um, different gowns, similar to a flower tablecloth or dresses. Um, I made a pink, I made it gloomy. Um, it represents my personality being pink and bright. It had been gloomy the days here. So go ahead, next slide. <laughs> Um, so then we'd gone to Garden Valley where James Castle was born. It was about an hour and a half away. Beautiful landscape. So then we went back to the archives, the collection and archives of James Castle. And I was thrilled that I'd seen James Castle's sister had given this alphabet card to the collection where James Castle, or where she had written to James Castle um, written a note to James Castle saying, something was wrong. that something was no more was what he, the note had said. And so this, the sister was in, informing James Castle potentially of a friend uh, from back from school that was no more, that he'd gotten out of the hospital, really unsure of, but it was a finger spelling card or an alphabet card of American Sign Language. And so he had written on there and what looked like I could see, so I had written down here what looked like the reflection of James Castle's face, his portrait, a reflection of himself reading that card. So next was the process of metamorphosis and liberating the deaf identity and letting that deaf identity grow. So the flowers have bloomed. And what do you notice with these? Someone's saying the water has spilled. The water at the top of the page has spilled and is bleeding down. And there's hands that are signing across the plate. So deaf folks, typically we sign, we sign big and every once in a while we'll hit the water glass and it's always a happy accident. You know, if you hit your water glass, there's no reason to be upset. It's a grateful moment that you have sign language to communicate. It's a moment of celebration. And so do you see the dinner table flowers? Maybe it's too far. When you go into the studio, if you look close, the flowers are actually, they become hands that are signs. So they're different. The petals are hand shapes that are used in American Sign Language. Uh, and you're probably now able to see those now. Um, and so that's the metaphor metamorphosis of what I feel was James Castle's life experience. So I had practiced what it looked like to spill some water on a table. And so you can see that here so that I was able to represent that in my art. So this is what the ceramic studio looked like of working with clay. So talking about James Castle and he loved um, to draw heads and he would change it to uh, squares or chairs or a frame and the eyes were hands or changing them to look like jail cells. Um, so I feel like that's a lot of the deaf experience being expressed through James Castle's art and how deaf folks um, interpret and see folks' as faces. There are so many different ways that he shows his representation and his art interpretation through faces. Well, I was on a walk one day and I saw my own shadow and I made a connection to some of James Castle's work. You know, the shapes that he uses for folks to represent people. Um, it looked like someone you could see, it looks like I've got um, a coat, a hood, and a big coat on, and that represented James Castle's work that you see here on the right. So that actually gave me an idea. 
that I would, I made my own template that I would use a lot um, on my ceramics that I was making, the clay pieces. I was trying to figure out how to do four different ones. It was a challenge for me because I had to get four. A shadow is 2D, but I was trying to create a 3D object. So I was trying to get four on each, like one on each side, creating some sort of a sh square shape. So the deaf identity when it comes to language deprivation, communication, and James Castle's artwork. So I love to draw something. James Castle loved to draw things from the front, from the sides, from far vantage points, from a close up vantage point. And I really think He's just trying to represent the 360 degree view that is his perception. Um, and for deaf folks, that visual acuity is so important. And I think it's really interesting to see that develop through his work. So when I had drawn it, um, I painted it and I had done the front and the back and then <laughs> like an open part of the coat and a closed part of the coat, of the coat, as you can see here. Next. So this, I have a little funny story about this one. So I'd love to see how James Castle would draw telephones and they almost were represented as dresses. And you can see that on the left side here. It's a telephone, but it looks like a dress. That was one of his common themes. So a funny story is I had gone into the thrift store and I had actually seen an old fashioned telephone, like a real, real old fashioned phone. I didn't buy it, but it was the exact same that James Castle had seen. He has advertisements of that type of phone. Um, and I didn't, I wasn't gonna purchase it, but I thought it was really cool. Well, the next day I had asked Monica, the staff member here at James Castle House, that I told her I wanted to go back. I wanted to purchase it. Something in me was telling me I needed to purchase it. Um, and she was joking that, well, it's probably because someone's going to call you. That's why. So we go to the thrift store and then within that day, someone had already purchased the phone. They were sold out of it. So I was bummed. So I come back to the studio and it felt like Maybe it wasn't meant to be that I purchased that phone, but then I felt a, that I could represent a head using that um, using that telephone shape. And I didn't even have to change the shape on that ceramic, that clay art, but I was able to use that telephone to represent that head. And so that's where I felt that inspiration came from there. So I thought it was an interesting, James Castle draws a lot of patterns and dots, um, cross hatching, X's, zigzags in his art. And so that really influenced me to show you next slide, to represent the patterns. So to see mountains from far away, you see that snow looks like snowflakes falling. On the bottom, it looks like mountains from a very small vantage point. Um, and then in the back, you can see mountains from a close up, those swirls that you see there. When you would turn it around, it almost looked like a mouth, the little hole that you saw there. So I thought that was a perfect opportunity to represent some sort of a mouth, um, some sort of speech or speaking. So that is one slab that's rounded. And one little area that uh, represents James Castle's arm. And so then you see some cross hatching and some patterns that represents his work. On the bottom, there's representation representation of a house and some people, and then the square. Um, head that is also a house with people in it. And you see some black signing, it's very small. Bad. 
And this is rotating, but it seems like that's the same photo. Go ahead. So then there's the back view and the side view. Next. Oh, we already did that slide. This reminds me of a painting on the bottom. There's a bunch of different people that you see. They've, they're have they under the same roof. And I feel like that connects to that clay drawing as well. Next. This is another one. So this is the coil method I used. And so I went around and around with some clay and I used a template to shape and roll after the coil method, and then I would scrub it smooth. And so that's showing here the painted front and back. There's lots of eyes that on the one side. And somehow I look at that and it almost reminds me of like eyes that are in an animal face. Um, lots of different views, interesting. And in the back, you see hands that are in some pockets. I just feel like that's really precious. Um, and maybe it represents the fact that sign language wasn't used every day, um, but you can take your hands out of your pockets for communication in American Sign Language then. Next. This is actually an exhibit that's here. Um, I always love to make construction paper dolls. Um, I thought those were really cute. And so I feel like this is represent, representing that next. So I applied that and that exhibit here inspired me to create these dolls on this mat. Different designs where the front is white with black lines and the back is black with different hands coming in, different sizes of hands and on different locations. Next. So this is a flat mat. Again, it's shadow figures with a house. This is a new experience for me. This is dipped. It's not painted. Um, and that was glazed at the Potter Center. And this was just another try, another dipped art piece. And you can see kind of on the bottom, I had made my own roller. Um, so I etched it and then it got hard and then I was able to roll it and then use it to print. And so that's what it looks like before it's dipped, right? It's not green yet. Next slide. So remember the broken clay vase? I went ahead and painted and had it glazed. So I went forth with it. It kind of reminds me of a salad bowl, but I added some white dandelions. Um, to I feel like that represents positivity. It's a little motif that represents deaf culture and that deaf people are will continue to be born and raised and keep the deaf community strong, that it's not a sign to fix us. Um, and then you see grass coming up and things emerging. It all represents the strength within the deaf community and that's out full. And then the crack, I feel like, is a perfect representation of fitting something together where you can put the puzzle or the pieces of the puzzle back together. And so I had done that and glued it. And when we fired it in the kiln, it had kind of one side had warped a little bit. Mm -hmm. I thought that was totally fine because that feels like that represents um, the opening of a mouth, which is the speech portion that affects deaf people. If you would put it together and put it in the kiln, a lot of times it will move together. That heat element 
um, affects how it moves differently. I think I, I just thought that was interesting the way that the clay had warped within that heat. Next slide. Um, oh, wow. Thank you for watching my presentation. Where are the red tiles? There were the 12 by 12 tiles were missing. Oh, whoops. Oh my, what happened? <laughs> Um, there was more. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so I had brought my grandmother's old wallpaper. And I wanted to do something with it. I had seen some wallpaper here. The James Castle um area has some red wallpaper with leaves on it. And so I had kind of put two and two together, which sparked my next project. Next slide. Oop. And so I experimented um, from my memory. So I didn't know what the wallpaper looked like. Um, so I was just trying to draw purely based off memory. And then I looked at the picture and I created the third iteration. Um, that had a, had more detail. Mm -hmm. So I had experimented with um, the wallpaper from the old house that I had seen, and I'd really practiced trying to put that together. I've got flowers and leaves, trying to add hand shapes in there. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, the stripes with all the different hands and leaves and waves in there. There's different stamps. Um, the color, it's called Napleton Red, Napoleon Red. Um, it's, it feels like a mix of red or hot pink and something. And so I had played with that and matched it perfectly, which was great. And that connected to this. I had carved some lino cut block, the same type of stripes. Next, please. And so there's a hands with different flowers blossoming and, and some stamped portions on that as well. And so then again, that evolved. Um, I would really love to have this as wallpaper. This is um, one side where you see hands and flowers. And then the other, you see two different hands going two different ways that represent flowers um, and with the different colors. I was playing and experimenting with this one. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next slide. <laughs> so this one, I did a black print. I did it 16 different times, stamped print. Um, and then I, I do did a color version again, but there was a lot of repetitiveness and iterations of this. And I had done it on a bag. I had played with printing on the this little tote. And I carved some more flowers and some eyes. You see on the bottom there it says death. There's a death carving. Go next, please. Um, and then I was walking and I was shocked to see um, that the snow had turned pink at sunset. And I tried to take some pictures and, and walk to a better vantage point. And so after that evening, I had come home or come back here and created these three drawings. And that's where James Castle a lot of times would do that. He would create three or four that all connected to each other. Um, like they were, you know, walking down a street. And I wasn't trying to do that. I wasn't trying, I was, I just needed a break from the ceramics. So I had painted those that looked like walking down the street with the metal view. So this one is the eyes, the mouth, and the ear. And as with a hearing person, they don't use their eyes, they speak and they listen. And then there's a square between both worlds. So 
going out into nature feels like I am out and in between both worlds. And then on the next one, the eyes see the communication through ASL and through sign language. And we feel vibrations, we don't listen. And so there's a lot of opposites in these two side by side. And you can see those opposites. So there's the house, there's the shed, and there's the trailer as well. And that's represented through James Castle. Next. This again, I was playing with two different things um, with um, textile or tactile fabric, um, or I had stuffed some things to create it more poofy. There's an eye with a, some blue flowers that look like hair. And then another side looks like an animal with some black lines around its face and eyes. I was playing around with those. Something that looks like a door potentially. Yeah. Um, and so remember the art that I had shown you of the three different iterations of the dinner table syndrome. I decided to transfer that to 12 by 12 tiles. I had started working on it about two weeks ago. At the bottom, you see the alphabet, um, that alphabet decal that James Castle's sister had sent. Um, so I had dipped it and stamped it onto the tile. And then I will do the same thing with James Castle's face on the plate. I haven't completed it yet. It's a work in progress. Um, and then again, I'll add please. On that. Again, it's a work in progress. <coughs> Um, this one I am done with. I finished this a few days ago. Um, the firing in the kiln makes the red look really bright. Um, so you can see it there. So it will look just like that after it's fired. Um, and so it will be fired. It isn't yet in this place. Okay. <laughs> So, so, so very much, Ellen. We're going to take some questions now. Um, Mackenzie, are there any online? And anybody here would like to ask a question to Ellen? She will go ahead and answer those now. She needs a little open. <laughs> Not, not online yet. Not online. Okay. I don't know why. Anybody first in town? Hands over. <laughs> wow. Stories and your artwork over the years and while you've been here. Very impressive. Your body of work, did, did, do you have that here? And can you show that? Oh, the compilation of art that I showed you in this presentation while it was done here. Are you asking if I'm, if I'm going to be showing it? Yes. After the Q&A, we can go into the studio to see the art in person. <laughs> so you do have it in the studio. I'm so excited. Yes, it's behind me. Yes, just behind this black mysterious curtain. We will reveal it. <laughs> yep, you are able to look around there to see the different things that I've made in person. There are a few pieces of art that I will donate to the James Castle House as well. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions? Hello. Hello. Hi. Good to see you. From the day you arrived to now, how have you changed? I don't know. Oh. I feel appreciative that James Castle of his art. Um, I, I am also an artist, but James Castle, I'm just so appreciative of his art. Thank you all for having me here. Thank you for recognizing me as an artist. It's an emotional process. 
also my personal upbringing um, and the database that I've had to unpack to use throughout this process. When I leave, um, that will forever be, you know, in that database, mm -hmm. this experience will be. Mm. <laughs> At home, I lead a very busy life. This residency has allowed me the opportunity to really focus on my identity and time as an artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. So um, what you've learned here, you'll take back with you. What are your goals when you go back home um, from what you've learned here? Um, I wouldn't use the word learned. Um, I would use the word uh, opportunity. I've had the opportunity to create. Um, so there've been lots of moments of creation, um, deep diving, reflection, and expression in my art. I've learned that my organic creative process, like that vase that had broke, that I'm able to still make something. Good can still come of that. It's not according to plan, but I learned that it's okay to be surprised and <laughs> things will come up. And so that shouldn't inhibit my creativity. That is, that is, I will say the one thing, there's something I have learned. Yes. Awesome. So you're an artist with deaf experience and involved with Davia. I think you're the first Davia artist to come to James Metzel House, right? We're so honored. So as a Davia artist, and you continue and um, to study and learn and follow James Castle. What did you find from James Castle that represents Davia? Um, yeah. Back at James James Castle time, J James Castle's time, Davia wasn't a word. Davia stands for represents deaf view. Um, and so like his art, like I'd mentioned, um, faces or heads that were changed to squares and houses that I would say is the death view that he created so he as a deaf person and creating deaf people in his art um, I feel like that that intertwines I really couldn't determine if he is a Davia artist but I would say in some aspects, yes, he shows his death experience through his art. And for me, um, that is also true as being part of a Divya. I would say he he was through that death experience. Okay, I want to expand on that question. With all the squares, the frames of the heads and so forth. How does that show uh, deaf experience in James Castle's mm -hmm. work because I don't understand the deaf experience, <laughs> but you do, and can you explain it? Well, through my experience of isolation and no communication, I think coincides with James Castle's, and so through that, there's a strong connection and, and relation there. So, like some artists or some art you see where one eye is larger than the other. Like, I get what he means. Do you understand why that's that way? Maybe not, but I feel like I understand those perspectives. Um, for me, it's, you know, reading lips. I, you know, I'm not understanding most of the time why he would draw things that way. I mean, it could be, it's speculation. So like all the different vantage points of, of simple things like a chair. Um, and a chair as a head, 
Um, for me, I would imagine sitting and being bored. That's my experience being isolated with no communication. Is that James Castle's experience also? Um, you know, I wish, I wish we could bring in a time machine and, you know, ask James Castle all of these questions and, and explore why, but those are just my speculations. I do see um, and feel through his work, through those shared experiences. Um, you know, I would imagine that he might say, thank you for understanding me. And other deaf artists could say the same for James Castle's work. And so I would encourage more deaf artists to get eyes on James Castle's work. Like there's a hand in front of his face on, or in front of a face on one of his pieces. Um, he had gone to the deaf school that was oral at the time. Um, you know, but being around deaf classmates, deaf friends, or feeling isolated, you know, he didn't speak. The teachers, maybe they were nice to him. Probably not. Um, so he probably rather being at home and creating his art where he was in his happy space. But it's really amazing how that unsocialization can have an impact on a person. Yeah. There's a question from the chat. Um, <laughs> come into frame. There you go, you're good. Um, uh, have you discovered that you have anything in common with James Castle, either in your work or personal life? Um, if so, what are those things? Yeah, some similarities that I I have mentioned those in my previous comment um, where he used, you know, a single chair and those different vantage points. And where he's got um, an image of his face, I feel like those are you know, common commonalities. You know, loving nature is a commonality. He gives me joy and a new taste of playing with dolls and art, like the bark, those bark dolls. Um, I feel like the commonality is he's very observant in the way he views the world and all of its details. It's similar to the way I do, I the way I see the world with lines and patterns and shapes, lightness and darkness. Yeah, those are just some, some of those. Um, I love that you brought so many wonderful materials, five boxes, of materials from home and especially your parents 1970s bed sheets and um i wanted to ask how much time have you spent at the collection and archive the james castle collection archive and how important has that been to your experience would the experience have been much poorer without getting to go to the james castle collection archive or would it have been just fine if you never got to see that work in person? Yeah. yeah. So I feel like as an artist, I'm a hoarder personally. <laughs> and so the house is fine, but please don't look in my basement. <laughs> so I felt like that this opportunity gave me the opportunity to recycle some of those things. Um, it's a lot of stuff, I know. I really wasn't sure what to expect upon arrival. And so I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing out on anything. Going to James Castle Collection and Archives, that experience, it really didn't feel real. The books I was looking at um, that I'd seen copies, those didn't feel real until I was there in person to see the body of work that I feel impacted me greatly. It gives me chills just thinking about it. 
I would, I felt like he was present in the room, you know, I don't mean to get teary eyed on you that he's gone, but the material we have is there forever. And it's, he's left this legacy. And so I'm so grateful that they preserved all of that work, um, the large body of work that his family preserved and saved for all that time. Yeah. Okay, two things of all the work. That's beautiful. Thank you. But what was the what's your one favorite thing from here? That's the first question. And then as a follow-up for James Castle and his art, what's your favorite of his that you've okay. seen? You can't ever name your favorite child, right? <laughs> <laughs> I really can't possibly pick my most favorite piece, but the experiencing and the accomplishment of that wallpaper specifically was incredible. Um, and I'm super thankful to the broken vase that allowed my organic creativity to really blossom during my journey. <laughs> And then, yeah, but what was your second question? James Castle's or what is your favorite of his oh. in the collection? Oh, there's so many amazing pieces. There's a classroom that looks very similar to my painting. Um, there's a portrait. And there was one that... It had a square face um, on the alphabet card. That was another one. Just left me wondering, did he practice the alphabet? Did his family know or didn't know? Um, did he do it in private? It just left me with so many questions. Oh, there's so many. His art room um, vantage points are beautiful, drawing from one end to the other. There's one that represents a landscape and there's paper that's in the middle that's put over it. And so he draws on top of it and then he takes it off, but then it's got that same drawing underneath. I just think it's cool that there's two different pieces to that. I've never done that. I, I see that with James Castle's art and it's very, very neat. Yeah. <laughs> I accept that answer. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Seems like we're ready to go into the studio. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ellen, for sharing with us. We have enjoyed having you here at the James Castle House. We're going to miss you. <laughs> I've Thank been you. so happy to be here. Thank you. I can't believe in 10 days, yeah. my journey will be over. Time has gone so quick. Yeah. And you're always welcome to come visit. <laughs>